just move to some questions now, and it's not too late to send your questions in now via the, the comment, comments box or via, the Twitter, via Twitter. So this is a question for you, Danny, for Deloitte, um, from Daniel. Um, how do you think businesses with no remote working infrastructure will cope? That's a very difficult question without knowing the industry, to be honest. Um, I think, and also the location of, of that business, I, I would... I would need to kind of start from the, from those premises. I think it ab absolutely depends where your offices or outlets are, um, and what you do as a business, and and your supplier base, and the extent to which um, you know you're impacted by them. So um, it could be the answer could be it might not affect them at all. It could be a really significant challenge, and um, it, I would just need to know a bit more. I think about the specific industry in that case. Okay. A question for, for you, Chris, or you, Danny, either one. One of the biggest barriers um, to remote working cultures or flexible working cultures is, um, is trust. So this element of trust that your employees will be working, will be productive and so on and so forth. How, how do you think um, companies can sort of overcome that big barrier if, if, it's, if they don't have a trust-based culture, essentially? How do they work towards that? Uh, uh, this... I have a big bugbear about it. And coming back to 20 years ago, when I was a junior army officer, um, I remember a general in my regiment saying, you've got to empower your soldiers. You've got to allow them. They will always mess up. And as long as you're willing to accept that and carry the can for that and be responsible for when they do mess up, you will get more from them if you empower them. And I think if we as business leaders, um, in whichever area we are in, we, we sort of have the attitude of empowering and trusting our workforce. We will get more from them, but we have to have the responsibility to um, accept that when the one individual does um, betray that trust, mm. that we as leaders carry that on our shoulders. We just don't immediately pass the blame onto them. But mm. anyway. Danny, any thoughts from you? Yeah, for, for me, I think that you summed it up quite well earlier on, to be honest. I think there are a number of building blocks that need to be put in place, and you know, they are about outcome-based measures of performance. It's about people really, truly feeling like they understand their role in their business and what they're contributing to. It's about a shared direction. It's about great leadership. It's about incentivising people. There's a lot of elements, I think, that all need to come together um, in, in, a, in order to enable people to, to feel that they want to contribute, because actually that's the key, is if people are motivated and want to deliver and, and are working towards uh, something themselves that they are bought into. I mean, for me, Locog is one of the best examples of that in itself. They, they have this wonderful um, culture there and because everybody's focused on one goal, you know, on delivering a fantastic games. Um, and whilst that is a great advantage to them, you know, trying to find your equivalent of that in your organisation that you can get people to buy into at overall, but also at business unit level and with your individual teams, I think that, that's absolutely essential. Mm. No, I, I completely agree. I think... To build trust, people need to know what they're meant to deliver and they need to be held accountable for delivering that. And, and so, you know, strong kind of um, appraisals and management capabilities and all those good things are really, are really needed yeah. in that. So a question for you, Chris. Um, <coughs> have you got any particular plans in place for your staff to watch the torch relay? Ah, <laughs> yes, um, we do. We, we've actually got a, a programme called Feet on the Street where we're trying to get all of our staff who are in in branches when the torch goes past to actually get out on the street with the general public and also try and bring the community and the community groups that they're involved with all together in a big celebration of supporting the community which is what we're trying to do around the torch relay so i think um we're, we're um, a presenting partner alongside coco and samsung of the torch relay it is going to be the biggest thing that grows and captures in the imagination and also it's running at exactly the same time as the Queen's Jubilee so you've got this street party celebration with the Queen's Jubilee you've got the torch street party celebration it's I think it's need the weather I, the, <laughs> we'll sort the weather out so um, we'll um, I just think it'll, it'll be amazing but we're actively encouraging everyone to get involved and get involved as much as possible and we've got 
every single location where the torch goes through, we've got a Lloyds employee who is a community ambassador and is involved in the whole local authority planning for that already and just trying to encourage people to get involved. Wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, so we've got one last question from Ian, and I think we've, we've already discussed this a little bit, but should businesses provide viewing facilities for staff to follow the games during the working day? And I think we've talked a little bit about that, whether that's on site or, but is there anything else either of you would want to add on, on that question? I think the, the simple answer would be yes, mm. but in a, in a way that um, is appropriate and in a way that um, really connects with people and is at the right times, I would say. Um, so it's not just a blanket approach to, you know, watch the games whenever you like, but we need to appreciate that different people will connect with different elements of the games. So, I mean, I personally remember getting really into Taekwondo in Beijing 2008, and I've never before or since watched Taekwondo. Um, so we need to bear in mind that at different times people will get really into different elements of the game so, and different sports and different stories, the, the athlete stories that will emerge. So it can't be a one size fits all, but um, you do need to find the right times and the right places to allow people to feel like they're part of a celebration, um, but that they're actually have been communicated in a way that makes it very clear that um, the expectation is, is still on, on delivery and on productivity. Okay. And my, and my answer to that is, again, yes is the short answer mm. but it's um it's much more about sort of getting getting it right for the right audience and um and you've got to link it in with the transport plan with the business continuity plan and so for example you know if the tubes are busy you might want to make sure that the tv screens are on for then and not to avoid the sort of productivity issues of everyone watching the whole thing during the day and not doing any work but, there, but there's some businesses, so DIY shops, for example, don't do much business during an Olympic Games because nobody does DIY. They're too busy um, watching games. So if you're a DIY shop staff or owner, um, maybe you should be doing more. Now, if you're a restaurant in central London, you don't want to have screens for your staff, maybe for your customers. So it, it, it mm. is kind of horses for courses. Yeah, no, absolutely. So. We're going to need to wrap up now, but do, you, do either of you, Danny or Chris, have any sort of final thoughts for viewers to help them plan, plan for success? Um, I think probably my main point, the main takeaway for people is to, uh, is to make sure that you seek out uh, the information that's already out there. So yes, people is a component of games readiness, but also as we've, we, we can't talk about people without talking about infrastructure and operations and clients and customers. So it, it needs to be um, an integrated program and you need to go and find the information that's already out there and then look inwardly in your own business and bring those two bits together. So from an external perspective, there's um, guidance called preparing your business for the games, which if you just pop that into Google, you'll find the recently released document. Um, there's the Olympic Delivery Authority's Keep On Running guidance um, and also TFL has produced maps of um, the Olympic and Paralympic route networks, for example, so you can see where your business is are related to those um, those routes and how they might affect you. So really be proactive, make sure you go out, find the information that, that's there, then overlay your own business onto that. So you need to get some information from your own people, your own systems, your own infrastructure, um, and think about your own clients and, and operations. Bring those together and then create a set of planning assumptions and, those are, and be realistic in the sense that those planning assumptions need to evolve. You're not going to be able to write your games readiness plan now and pop it on a shelf until July next year because more information will emerge and you will understand more about your own business, about the the likely demand for your services or your goods and there'll be more information from organizations like tfl in the lead up so okay. that would be i guess my summary i think thank you, you and, and i guess from our side first of all we've got a freely available games time ready guide for business which is lloyd's games time ready guide in google you'll get there which goes through all of these issues and has um, a checklist mm -hmm. of everything whether from security to hr issues to transport um, but i'd always I always use the six P's, another thing from my army day. So um, prior preparation and planning prevents poor performance. And it's absolutely got to start doing stuff now. You've got to start planning um, for games time and celebrate. It will be an amazing year next year for the whole of the UK. So let's just join in that celebration. Absolutely. Well, thank you both very much. Um, 
If we weren't able to answer your question and we didn't get to it, then we will, of course, email you a reply. And you can find out more information and advice on how to ensure your business runs productively um, through the games um, by keeping an eye on future webinars on the rest of this site. So um, you can also uh, follow the Business Ready 2012 LinkedIn group to continue the discussion. And please don't hesitate to contact any one of us if you want further advice or solutions for your business. We really hope that you found this useful and please do give us your feedback by filling in the survey below. Thank you very much. Goodbye.